here's what I've been up to since the last video. Finally got the car on track. I uh, took it to Sonoma Raceway or Sears Point. Here's some people I paid to let me pass to make it look like I was going fast. Good news and bad news. Good news, I got the car up to 115. There's not a lot of straights there. So even that was, was kind of impressive. And I wasn't driving hard. I wasn't going that fast. I'd never driven Sonoma before. But car didn't fly apart, didn't explode. Oil temp, water temp all stayed nice and cool. Basically all the things I was a little worried about turned out to be fine. But then the car did a couple things uh, I wasn't expecting. Uh, one, it was pulling to the right a little bit under hard braking. It was fine acceleration, fine if just lifting the acceleration. It was fine under light braking, but under heavy braking, it was pulling to the right a little bit. Also, turn six is a big horseshoe-shaped curve, and coming through there, I was finding I was having to squeeze the, the steering wheel pretty hard to keep it from slipping in my hands. And after the third session, my hands were getting pretty sore from, from just clenching it so hard. And then slowing down from triple digit speeds between six and seven, because turn seven's a, a, a tight hairpin, it felt like I was getting a little bit of brake fade. It was, a, it was a hot day, it was over 90 degrees out, which again was a good test on the engine. I was worried about the engine being so enclosed in there, getting enough cooling, but that was all fine. So after the event, got the car home. Uh, the first thing I did was looking for the braking problem just kind of examined everything. I did a four-wheel alignment with string, which I had done in the past. I hadn't done in a while just because you just try to you know make sure you're doing the same thing evenly uh, when I was making any kind of small alignment changes. But I found the rear wheels were about an eighth of an inch further to that side than the front wheels. Not a lot. I don't know that you could feel that, but I corrected that. I found uh, this side had about 0.3 of a degree more caster than that side. And I, I had to figure out a new way to do caster because uh, measuring it, there's a number of ways to measure caster. And a lot of times when you do it, if you measure it without changing anything three times, you get slightly different results each time. And that, that's the kind of thing that really drives me crazy. Uh, but I think I, I've got a new system now that is giving me repeatable results. So that could be it. The other thing that would make the most sense is I found I had a small tear in the CV boot on this side in, in the rear, and it was spraying just this fine little bit of grease. And so you think, okay, that got on the brake rotor and that was causing uneven braking. Uh, the only thing is I couldn't find any evidence that the grease was getting on the rotor. It, it sprayed in a couple places, but you could see real clearly where it sprayed. So, you know, any of these things could have been it. Again, I would never notice it if I wasn't going over 80 and slamming on the brakes really hard. But I'm a, I gotta get it back on track to find out if I've got it all sorted. It's, I've had this with other cars where usually I start with autocrossing before I take the car to the track just to find any major problems at a lower speed. And what happens is you get the car and it's, it works perfectly, you don't have any problems, and then you get it on track and suddenly it does things that it's never done before and you just didn't know because you'd never had it that fast. Got a new steering wheel. It's an inch bigger in diameter and it's got Alcantara lining, which isn't you know, period correct, but uh, I don't want to die when I'm trying to turn. Uh, so I think that's more important. I, you know, I, just, I, need the, um, I need the friction in my hands so I don't have to grip it so hard. I also stiffened the attaching points uh, for uh, the steering column uh, under the dash. Uh, it had a little bit of flex. So I, I firmed that up. I finally added a speedometer. Uh, it's a GPS speedometer, so I didn't have to wire anything to the gearbox. I'm a little conflicted with that. I don't think race cars should have speedometers. You don't look at the speedometer, you go as fast as you can. But I was calculating how fast I was getting up to in places using the revs and, and knowing the gear ratios and the tire diameters. But I thought it was a nice addition. It filled a, a space I had in the dash. And obviously that's supposed to be on the other side of the dash. But if you go back to my original video series, you'll hear the story of how my dash showed up in the wrong orientation and I cut it up. And because of that, the speedometer spot is on the wrong side in my car. While I was doing this, uh, there was another problem that I fixed. The, because I'm just using Lexan for the rear window, uh, it caused the, the rear clip to sag a little bit right up up here so instead of having this this curve down it kind of went like that and without the 
the Lexan in there, the fiberglass had the right shape, but you, you put that in the weight just makes it sad because the Lexan doesn't have any shape to it. And I thought, you know, when I redo everything and make the panel gaps all better, I'll put some extra fiberglass in there and uh, make that stiffer so it holds its shape. And it dawned on me while I was, was fixing this stuff, uh, these other things like, you know, if I just put a strip of aluminum in there in a 90 degree angle and, and curve it, uh, you know, shape it so it's got the right curve in it, I can just bolt it to the screws I'm already using uh, to hold the, the Lexan in and it'll hold it to that shape and it even gives then the Lexan, you know, putting that little bit of, of curve shape in the Lexan makes the Lexan stiffer. So that, that helped there and I, I tightened up this panel gap while I was at it. That, none of that really matters, it's just something that was, I realized, hey, this is an easy fix that I can do right now while, while I'm doing other stuff. And I'm getting more and more into the idea of I'd really like to take all the body off and get all the panel gaps nice and tight and even uh, and repaint it. Um, so, so someday. So then I took the car to Crow's Landing for an autocross, which usually that's a great place for autocrossing. Uh, we get it up to some higher speeds. There's a lot of space, a lot of room to kind of have a, a mini racetrack out there with nothing to hit. So you can really push the car. And the car was just sliding all over the place. Uh, I wasn't going particularly fast and, and the tail just kept kept wanting to, to step out everywhere and I thought you know these slicks were always too hard for the car I've got some some softer slicks picked out for it not that I have the money but you know the, these tires they're now I've been running on for two years they're actually three years old uh, I had them for a year before I started running uh, because of the delay I had with the, the axles in the back I thought you know maybe they're just shot and I was a little worried because I've got I had a trip to Laguna Seca coming up and I thought you know maybe maybe I should just skip that because the car is just it's, it's not dangerous to drive but you have to go pretty slow or, or you're all over the place um, but uh, in doing my usual checks afterwards and going through everything I found uh, I had a broken link on the front sway bar so the front sway bar wasn't doing anything and that kind of explains the tail happiness well there's your problem Actually, that wasn't the problem. It was the bolt that went through the snaps. The, the broken link was because I had a little too much misalignment uh, in the rod ends on, on the links. And so I both fixed the amount of misalignment it had uh, and got some better hardware that can allow for more misalignment. So I, I fixed it in two ways. That, that should be fine now. Then the other big thing I did after Crows, something I've been trying to get to for a while, is I redid the rear suspension to get the wheels centered in the rear wheel wells. This goes back to a mistake when when I was fitting the body I actually adjusted the location of the wheel well slightly and I did it based on where the wheels were and what I didn't realize because I'd had the car together and apart numerous times as I was building it that at that time I didn't have the rear wheels in alignment and what it was was I had so much toe in that when I, I put the toe back to a reasonable spot the wheels were now a half inch further back than they were when I got the wheel wells all nice and centered. So I just had to make some new control arms, weld them up, and now the, the wheelbase is the, the correct 95 inches. And I think that's gonna go nicely with when uh, I move the engine location, I'm gonna move it down, I'm gonna move it forward a little bit. Uh, so I'll kind of have the same relation that I had before when the wheels were further back. And then if you've seen the other video that I've just put out, uh, I got new brakes for the front. trying to cure that that brake fade I was getting getting a little more heat dissipation bigger improvements probably going to be the 16 pounds per corner I took off of unsprung weight with it and then a lot of it's just bling factor uh, but now it's got the kind of brakes it ought to have in the front then I got the car back on track this time at Laguna Seca a track I know much better it's the day before Halloween so I thought that was a perfect time to scare the crap out of myself so I've brought a car with too much power and not enough weight with tires that are too old to the racetrack. Downside of Laguna Seca is sound restrictions and that's why you end up with extra mufflers like I've got here. That knocks a whole two decibels off the car.
I got to take my kid to Pebble Beach to the Concours this year. That was really amazing. He's been to a lot of vintage racing events, but I haven't taken him to a lot of car shows, and he's more into supercars than race cars. So this event was just perfect for him. Uh, I mean, we walked right in. His favorite car at the time was the Ferrari SP3, and they had all three of the Ferrari SP cars lined up right as you walk in. But his new favorite car is now the Hennessy Venom F5, which we were behind on the road going through Monterey for a while. Then we got to see it at the event where they, they put the concept cars around. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting information about it on my phone telling my son, oh, it's got 1800 horsepower. Uh, and his, you know, mind blown. And now uh, we have it on a mug. In a weird way, and maybe it's just because I'm getting older, I'm finding I like working on the car more than taking it to events. And a, a lot of that is because in order for me to get to an event, I've got a hectic week trying to get everything done that I need to get done so I can be away for a day or two. Then, you know, the, the night before loading up the car, the, the, putting the car on the trailer, loading up the truck with, with all the tools I need and everything, uh, not getting a good night's sleep, getting up at 4.30 in the morning, towing the car to the event, getting there, being kind of rushed again to, to unload. And then you get to, you're driving on track, you're, you're doing an autocross, whatever. You know, there are times when you're sitting in traffic in your normal day-to-day -day life and, and it's just so frustrating. You think, man, it'd be great to be blasting around a track right now. But the thing is, I don't feel like that when I finally get to the event. At the point where I'm at the event, I'd rather be back in bed. And now I'm trying to make myself go fast and I'm just, I'm not feeling particularly enthused or brave and so then you just kind of have a disappointing outcome to it. I mean, it's it's still fun. It's just more often than not, I'm getting home, I'm looking at the footage and realizing, you know, I'm just not pushing it like I used to and I'm not doing myself or the car justice. Of course, then, yeah, you've got, after the event, you've got the tow home, then you've got to get the car off the trailer, you've got to put everything away. I'm probably now behind on things that I need to get done, even though I got a bunch of extra stuff done before I went. And I'm starting to wonder if I shouldn't just be treating this hobby more like a model railroad. Uh, let me explain. My dad builds model railroads, and he doesn't have to go to events. He just, he spends his free time working on them, creating things, making things better, adding to them, changing things, and then sometimes just running them, just, just sitting and enjoying it. And that's so much more relaxing and rewarding in, a, in the sense of I got something done and I'm, I'm proud of what I did. I guess if I were doing better on track, I would be proud of that. I'm just wondering if I'm to a point in my life where I should just admit that I enjoy working on the car in my spare time in afternoons and evenings more than I like getting up at four in the morning and going to an event and being on my feet all day. The, the thing is, I've spent my whole life saying a race car is meant to be raced. If it's not being raced, what's the point? So I'm kind of in this internal argument with myself. So what do you think about all this, bud? I'm amazed you get a Ferrari. Thanks, bud. So what is next? I'd like to get the same brake package that I got for the GT40 on this car. Uh, it drops 16 pounds per corner of unsprung weight, which I think will make a much bigger difference on the handling of this car. But that costs money that I don't have. So what I'll probably do next is uh, move the engine on the GT40. I figured out I can do three quarters of an inch down and a half inch forward just to make the center of gravity as good as it can be. And I can do that just with a little bit of raw steel that I already have. As for the channel, I haven't been making a lot of videos lately and that's for a couple reasons. Uh, when I started, I would just been laid off of my work and I had some free time and I thought it was a good opportunity to document what I'd done uh, with the GT40 and the other car. It was something I had been thinking about doing for a while and now it seemed like I finally had the opportunity to do it. But then it was starting to take up a little too much of my time and I figured I needed to spend a little more time trying to find steady work. Uh, I'd like to find a full-time job before I have to sell the cars to pay for food. And money is another reason. When Road and Track first wrote the article on my GT40 series and the views just started skyrocketing, I thought, hey, maybe there's some revenue to be made here and I can do something cool. I can take that money and put it into making more videos. And you know, if it was a lot of money, maybe I could do another car build. 
I have crazy dreams about like making a car where everything's adjustable to the point that we can test it with specifically different centers of gravity, weight distribution, roll centers, uh, and combinations of the things where you're changing one parameter at a time and taking it out and testing and see what they do. So you know when you're having to make compromises making a, building a car, you know, hey, if I have to do this, it's going to affect it this way. You know, the lap times are going to be affected this much. If I do this instead, if I make this compromise, it's going to do this. But that all seems like a pipe dream now. You know, if I was making some money from the videos, uh, I would do more things like I just did with the, the brake upgrade video where, you know, how-tos and discussion videos about different upgrades to the car and design things. It would also be cool to go out and film other people's creations and get their stories and document that. But in the six months my videos have been out there, I've made a grand total of $102 before taxes. And based on which of my recent videos people watch and which they don't watch, it seems like if I don't have really good subject matter to make a video on, I just shouldn't make a video. So I've been focused on finding steady work. I mean, it would be a dream to get to combine my professional career of doing video work uh, with building cars. It'd be nice to just get to build cars. Uh, I've thought about offering my services to assemble kit cars for people or maybe uh, build chassis like my Lotus 38 replica. But honestly, who knows what the future holds at this point. So thanks for watching. I hope you get to get out there and do something awesome. And if I get to do anything awesome, I'll be sure to make a video about it and get it up as soon as I can.